Let me start by welcoming everyone to this uh, webinar on uh, how to build a comprehensive suicide prevention strategy. So this is one of a series of such webinars that have been organized through the Mental Health Innovation Network. Uh, this is funded by Grand Advances Canada, uh, it's facilitated by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, as well as WHO and seeks to foster the synthesis and exchange of knowledge related to global mental health innovation policy and practice. So, uh, moving to today's webinar, uh, my name is Dan Chisholm, uh, based here at Dubs uh, WA Show, uh, but I'm also one of the partners to the Mental Health Innovation Network. So I'll be your host today, along with my colleague Dr. Sammy Hanna, and um, so uh, the other person that uh, we wish to particularly invite to this uh, webinar is our star guest, uh, Dr. Alexandra Fleischmann. Alexandra is also based at the uh, WHO in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. Uh, she is the scientific uh, or technical uh, coordinator for uh, suicide work in the department, and she was also the chief editor of the recent WHO report on uh, suicide prevention. So we're going to start with a presentation by Alexandra, which may take around 15-20 minutes, and then we have a number of questions that uh, have already been posed uh, via uh, the NHIN network. Uh, so we've received some of those, so we'll start with that, and then hopefully that'll still leave a few minutes for any other questions. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Alexandra Fleischmann speaking. And I understand that we have participants today from all around the world, which to my mind reflects already the phenomenon of suicide because it's a phenomenon all over the world, across societies, geographical areas. Everyone uh, is affected. I immediately accepted the invitation for holding this webinar because it's timely. It's the right moment, right now. Why? There are two milestones that happened recently. And the next slide, please. In 2013, WHO member states adopted the global uh, – the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the Global Mental Health Action Plan 2013-2020. And this is a commitment from all the WHO member states to work towards suicide prevention. This Mental Health Action Plan has suicide and the reduction of suicide rates included as an indicator and as a target. So this was a very important event for suicide prevention. And the second milestone is the first ever WHO Suicide Prevention Report, Preventing Suicide, a Global Imperative, which was published in September 2014, so only a few months back. And this report calls upon all member states to take action and to take action now. So this is the background of why I thought that today is the perfect day to, to talk about suicide and how to implement uh, comprehensive suicide prevention strategies. The key messages which I would like to convey today are that suicides take a high toll, suicides are preventable, and we know what works in suicide prevention. The time to take action is now. And if it's only these key messages that you take home with you today, then I think we already can move ahead. Um, first of all, I would like to set the scene a bit about uh, what, what's the scope of the problem. I would like to share some suicide facts. There are over 800,000 people who die by suicide every year, and this translates to one death every 40 seconds. So this is quite astonishing. For each suicide, there are likely to be more than 20 others making an attempt, which would mean that there are at least 20 million attempts 
per year and taking into account family, friends, work colleagues, the persons around those who die or those who attempt suicide, then we know that there are many millions of people around the world who suffer or are affected uh, by suicide. Most importantly, or quite importantly, is that suicide is the leading cause of death, that leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. And for the 15 to, to 19 year old girls globally, it's even the first leading cause of death. And this is quite tragic. If we think, what is it that young people are dying from? It, it's suicide. The first cause why young people die is suicide. So this is quite a, a tragic loss. Seventy-five percent of suicides occur in low- and middle-income countries. There might be a preconception that suicide is an issue more relevant in high-income countries, but in reality, 75% of global suicide cases occur in low- and middle-income countries. So it's really a global phenomenon. It's relevant to all countries. The male-to-female ratio is lower in low- and middle-income countries. So for high-income countries, and what you might have been exposed to the knowledge that there are like three times more men than women who die by suicide, but the fact is that in low- and middle-income countries, um, this ratio is much lower, and there are even a few, a handful of countries where there are actually more uh, women dying by suicide than men. Globally, the most common means of suicide are uh, self-ingestion of pesticides, hanging, and, and firearms. And globally, when we think about all the different causes of death, uh, then suicide account for 1.4% of all deaths in the world. And or globally, overall, it's the 15 leading cause of deaths uh, estimated for the year 2012. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we just see a highlight of what I just said about uh, the numbers of suicide that when you look at the numbers and the distribution geographically and by age, you see that most suicides are, um, occur in the, the younger age groups, and uh, it's the low- and middle-income countries who have the highest burden of suicide cases. In the next slide, I would like to quickly mention the data quality. The quality and availability of data on suicide and suicide attempts is extremely poor globally. With regard to attempts, there are only 20 countries known in the world who have surveys, national surveys, um, about suicide attempts. And only three countries are known to have a hospital-based case registration of suicide attempts. So this is too little we know about suicide attempts. And with regard to mortality, there are only 60 countries that have good quality vital registration data on mortality. So the improvement of surveillance and dissemination of data is necessary, and it's necessary to inform action. So I set the theme here with giving some ideas about the scope of the problem, what we are talking about. So in the next slide, I would like to quickly tell you about the WHO's Mental Health Action Plan 2013-20, because I mentioned that we have an objective, objective three, which is to implement strategies for promotion and prevention in mental health. And the global target, 3.2, is to reduce the rate of suicide in countries by 10% by the year 2020. And this is what member states of WHO have committed to. So that's your resolution. In the next few slides, you see about the proposed actions. So in the, this slide, it's about the member states. Which, so the proposed action for member states from this mental health action plan is to develop and implement comprehensive national strategies for the prevention of suicide, so that's the topic we are addressing today. And in the next slide, it's the actions for the WHO Secretariat, which is to provide technical support to countries, and this is what we take uh, 
very serious case, so WHO is available in, at any moment uh, at the request of a specific member state to send a delegation to do together a situation analysis to map the existing activities that are already ongoing or not, to map, map the stakeholders that should be involved. Um, so the readiness of the WHO secretary is very clear. And in the next slide, it's proposed actions for partners. And here the highlight, the emphasis should be on the implementation, to help in the implementation. Um, to have a national strategy on paper does not help. We need to implement, implement, implement. That's, that's the key action that needs to be done now. Um, in the next slide, we see that the progress of the Mental Health Action Plan will be monitored, and we have to report back to the WHO Executive Board. And this shows accountability, and this is important for every country when implementing a national strategy, there needs to be a sense of accountability. Everyone plays a role, whether you're a student, a researcher, a government official, policymaker, someone who has lost someone, or if you're someone who has attempted suicide, or in with a friend, a family, or a work colleague, everyone has to play a role. Everyone needs to be a partner in suicide prevention. In the next slide, um, I'd like to take a look at what is needed in order to take action. Um, so the, the report on suicide prevention, which was published at the end of last, towards the end of last year, proposes to work along a public health model. And so we already looked at the first point, which is surveillance, to know what's the problem and to improve the data. And the second point is to identify risk and protective factors. And here I would like to point out that reducing risk will only go part of the way, and the furtherance of protective factors will help towards reducing suicide in the future. So if you're a researcher the, in, in enhancing our knowledge about the role of protective factors and how they can be added in our preventive programs will be um, important for furtherance of our suicide preventive work. In the next slide, we see uh, the evidence-based interventions. I mentioned at the beginning as a key message, we know what works in suicide prevention. There are evidence-based interventions which can be implemented immediately. It's reducing access to means of suicide. It's responsible reporting by the media. It's introducing alcohol policy to reduce the harmful use of alcohol. Early identification and management of mental disorders and suicidal behaviors, it's training of health workers, and to provide follow-up care of those who attempted suicide and uh, to provide community support. What is important in taking action in the next slide is to take a multi-sectoral approach. Suicide is a complex issue with a multitude of factors involved, and there is no one answer to this problem. We have to work together across different sectors. Multi-sectoral collaboration is key, and the government must assume the role of leadership in suicide prevention. In the next slide, we, we look at the development of national strategies. One systematic way of developing a national response for suicide prevention is through the creation of a national suicide prevention strategy. And a national strategy may not be the starting point in a country. There may be existing activities already. However, a national strategy can assist in providing a broad plan. And the process of consulting the different stakeholders can create an environment for change. Today, there are only 28 countries reported to have a national strategy, and we have case examples from a number of countries who implemented action. Um, however, it's important to point out that a comprehensive suicide prevention strategy can be a rallying point for bringing different stakeholders together and for starting a participatory approach towards suicide prevention. It's an opportunity to spark debate, an opportunity to raise awareness, 
and it can be a driver for change. And governments are in a unique position to start this process uh, to involve stakeholders. On the next slide, there are some arguments that can be used to justify why we need a national strategy. Then a national strategy recognizes suicide and attempts as a major public health problem. It signals the commitment of governments. It recommends a structural framework. It provides authoritative guidance on key evidence-based suicide prevention activities. It identifies the key stakeholders and allocates specific responsibilities among them. It identifies crucial gaps in legislation, in service provision, and data collection. It indicates the human and financial resources required. It shapes advocacy, awareness raising, and media communications, and proposes a robust monitoring and evaluation framework, and thereby instilling a sense of accountability. It provides a context for research agenda on suicidal behaviors. So there are a multitude of reasons why a national strategy uh, can be useful in working towards suicide prevention. On the next slide, uh, when you look at uh, existing national strategies, there are typical components that can be identified, but they are in line with the evidence-based interventions. Um, and also point out the, and emphasize the importance of surveillance, having good quality and reliable data available, and also um, the point about oversight and coordination, which is necessary to be successful eventually. Um, in the next slide, we see a framework for the development of a national suicide prevention strategy. The first point of identifying the key stakeholders is the first step. The process of bringing them together and to clearly demarcate the roles and responsibilities can be difficult and challenging at the beginning. However, in the end, it, it will show that it's very useful to have the different stakeholders on board from the very beginning and to keep them on board throughout um, development, implementation, and evaluation. Strong leadership is essential to have a vision, to provide a vision to the stakeholders and to ensure that they work together. Such leadership does not necessarily need to come from the health sector. It can come from, from any of the stakeholders, but it's essential to move forward. Another important role uh, in this uh, graphic is the achievement of political commitment and the uh, increase of awareness. It's in, for political commitment, it may be useful to identify a public figure as a champion to, to emphasize the work and to, to help to advocate for the prevention of suicide. And the awareness is important to create an environment that helps to, to change, that helps to instill the sense of the relevance for suicide prevention. This can be scientific events, public events, communication from the media um, and about where to seek help or policy briefings. So there is a multitude of ways to create an environment that is more suitable to implement the suicide preventive work. On the next slide, we see some challenges in developing and implementing national suicide prevention strategies. On the one hand, suicidal behavior is still known to be criminalized in some countries, and on the other hand, there can just be insufficient resources. There can be ineffective planning and coordination, collaboration, and lack of enforcement of guidelines and limited or no access to surveillance data on suicide and particularly attempted suicide. And also very important, the lack of process and outcome evaluation while implementing programs. So there are many challenges, but these can be overcome. In the next slide, I want to emphasize that the time to act is now. In the report on suicide prevention, which was published last September, it is clearly pointed out 
No matter where its country currently stands in suicide prevention, there are steps to be taken. Be the country with no suicide prevention activities so far with some or with a comprehensive strategy. There are actions that can be taken. Already the activity of seeking out stakeholders, developing activities opportunistically where there's the greatest need or where there are resources existing, or implementing targeted suicide prevention programs can already contribute to a national response eventually. I'm coming to close to the end of my presentation where I would like to point out Again, the emphasis on the technical assistance, the WHO is ready to provide technical assistance to all member states who request this assistance. And as I just said, there are actionable steps from a country's current position that can be taken now. It will be important to improve the data, particularly on suicide attempts. There are indicators and targets along the way. There's the ultimate target by year 2020. However, on, on the way, there will be many other indicators and targets that will need to be reached. And uh, WHO will collaborate uh, with the different WHO regions and the different international partners. There are, on the next slide, a few technical tools for implementation that should be mentioned. There's the NH Gap Intervention Guide which has a module on self-harm and suicide with specific recommendations for the assessment and management of self-harm and suicide with training materials so you can write to us. We can provide those training materials to you. There's um, there are training materials about um, uh, training non-specialized health workers with a detailed timetable. Uh, some guidance on how to develop the training, how, where to get the space, what is necessary, all slides are there. There's a, a module for program planners, a situation analysis tool, an adapt adaptation guide, a monitoring evaluation tool, so the, the, all the material is there ready and available. It's also important to point out that the WHO step survey, which is a survey, National Survey on, on Risk Factors, um, it has a module on suicidal behaviors included. So that's for the past two years, it has this module included, so it's important to take that with you. Um, this survey can be used with technical assistance by WHO. On the next slide, you find a few more resources, um, resource series or uh, booklets on preventing suicide addressed to different professional groups like teachers, primary health care workers, counselors, police, firefighters, other first line interveners. There's a booklet on case registration of suicide, case, case registration of non sets of fatal suicidal behavior. The one, the resource document in the middle is the public health action for the prevention of suicide, a framework document for developing a national strategy. And the last one here on the slide is the MindBank online platform, which uh, provides uh, the policy documents that, that can be found in the public domain on, on mental health policy, but also including um, suicide prevention strategy or action plan documents. So they're available or accessible through this platform. I would like to conclude with two slides, one on the key messages to take home that suicides take a high, high toll, suicides are preventable, and we know what works. So there are different interventions, and we can work together to reduce the burden from suicide. And the last slide is to point out the World Suicide Prevention Day, which is um, on 10th September every year, so that would be on the next slide. It's organized by the International Association for Suicide Prevention, and it, it's one opportunity for every one of us. Everyone is involved in suicide prevention, and this day is one opportunity to raise awareness about the, the, the huge burden of suicide, all those affected around the world. So, so to commemorate this day and um, have an event planned 
and this can be very powerful. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm concluding my presentation here, and please, uh, I'm handing back to Dr. Chisong, the host. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Alexandra. That was a uh, really uh, a superb uh, overview of uh, both the, uh, the the recent report that you are so intimately involved with, but also uh, I think providing very clear, um, structured sort of guidelines or uh, suggested uh, ways forward for developing uh, strategies at the national level. Uh, I think this provides the, the kind of the global context that obviously one needs to move from uh, from global to to, to national implementation. Um, so, um, uh, and indeed, in fact, already since the uh, the launch of this report, this has has uh, led to numerous requests from from member states. Uh, and in fact, one of the questions from uh, in, in, that uh, we received already. Uh, for this uh, webinar that came from Afghanistan asking for this kind of technical assistance about, you know, what are the appropriate principles and, and measures that can be taken to uh, develop a strategy in that context. So I think that, that itself is a, is a good example. So what we uh, are going to move to now is uh, some of the uh, other pre-received uh, questions. Um, and we've done a bit of sorting uh, of those just to provide some structure and order to them. Uh, so we've basically got sort of three main questions that we'll take initially. And if we've got a bit of time at the end, we can see if there are other questions that uh, people have uh, who are on the, uh, on the webinar now. And by the way, for those who are arriving late, um, if you have a question, then you need to submit that uh, using the chat function which you will see down uh, on, on the panel uh, in front of you, I hope. And you can submit that question to Dr. Sammy Hanna, who is one of the listed names on the to select his name and submit your question to him. So uh, starting with the first question that we've got here, uh, Sandra, uh, we've got, uh, uh, I mean, you talked a lot about the, uh, how, you know, the process of developing a strategy and, and the principles and the content and so on. Um, and the question here is, is sort of goes slightly beyond that, which is, you know, once, once you have a, a strategy that's been developed, how can governments be supported to ensure that, uh, that the strategies are actually taken up by, by communities? And you've talked about the importance of communities in one of your concluding slides. So, uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's talking about that particular issue. This is a very important question that needs to be asked early on in the process. It, indeed, uh, communities play a critical role in suicide prevention, and they can provide social support to vulnerable individuals and engage in follow-up care. They can fight stigma and support those bereaved by suicide. So they are a stakeholder in the process. The communities and representatives from the communities need to be on the table already during the development of the national strategy in order to be a partner then also in the implementation and evaluation. So it's very critical to ascertain and seriously um, have um, community representatives involved from the very beginning, which then ensures that uh, the concrete uh, programs in implemented would then actually be taken up by the communities as we go along. It would be powerful already at the beginning or later on in the implementation to to just physically travel there, that representatives of the government mm -hmm. actually visit the communities and have a community event there. Um, we are working actually in the follow-up of the report that was published uh, on a concrete uh, community tool, and there there will be uh, interventions like members of the parliament speaking to communities member. Um, convening meetings, seeking to interchange, exchange with, in the community as, as an important step to take. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that's good. Now, uh, community is a, it's a fairly broad term. And within a community, there are many 
subgroups. And we had a number of questions, in fact, about such subgroups, uh, including um, rural or, or potentially quite sort of isolated communities. Um, so that was a, a second sort of set of questions. So maybe we could go through, you know, one or two of these if, uh, in the time. But uh, you know, the question was really from each of these was how can national suicide registry families you know, kind of people ensure that their scope reaches particular or vulnerable groups, uh, including those in rural or isolated communities, uh, refugees and migrants, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and sexual communities, uh, and also men uh, who, as I say here, you know, have uh, higher rates of suicide in many parts of the world, but actually have lower rates of, of both health seeking and indeed reported depression, uh, which are, you know, raising the question of whether a more gender specific approach is, is, is needed here. Yeah, um, with regard to, to rural isolated communities and the, the internet, um, of course we have to think back at the time where internet was not existent as yet. So there are, there are still ways, even though today we get used to just, you know, taking our computers and logging on, um, th there are indeed uh, areas where th these services are not available. So we, we can still uh, travel to these communities, involve the, the village leaders or traditional healers in the communities. Oftentimes there are volunteers um, that can be engaged and there are ways to um, uh, develop information material, leaflets um, to be disseminated uh, even in, in isolated villages. Uh, so there, there are, even in, in the time of, of internet and social media, uh, there are still ways that we know of where we can um, uh, contact and, and work in, in even isolated communities. And also the MHCAT uh, program uh, proposes to train non-specialized health workers, which you would typically find in, in rural or isolated communities. But it, 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 it is a call to implement MHCAT um, uh, also in, in these areas. Um, with regards um, to to men, uh, this kind of is, I think, an important uh, issue also uh, to address. Um, it, as pointed out, that yes, generally speaking, they have higher men have higher suicide rates uh, than women. Um, however, as also pointed out, it's it's not necessarily the case everywhere in the world. And we would have to hypothesize why this may be, and one hypothesis is um, the, the means, uh, the methods for suicide that uh, men employ, which may be more more lethal. So in the end, um, oh, if it's an issue of lethality, it would still be important to address uh, both sexes equally, and the uh, overall population Interventions among the effective interventions that were mentioned in one slide, um, the population intervention uh, level interventions like reducing access to means, uh, the responsible reporting by the media, and the implementation of alcohol policies, these uh, would uh, apply to all the different. Uh, 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 groups or men and women, and these uh, interventions tend also to be the more cost-effective ones. Mm -hmm. So, as as a um, initial and global approach, uh, one would need to address uh, both sexes um, at the same time. However, as you go further down the road in your specific country, wh while you uh, adapt your um, strategy and make it more sophisticated as you go along, it's certainly worthwhile mm. to, to look at the specific needs of certain age groups or the men or the women. So further down the road, your uh, strategy could be targeted, for instance, more towards middle-aged men. And as pointed out, they're, they're known to um, be not... Uh, so um, good or, or that the health seeking may, may be an issue for them. And so in a targeted manner to address 
um, how to enhance the health seeking of middle-aged men, for instance, and there are already studies and first results underway where it seems that through the Internet, um, there, it, it may be more easy for men uh, to seek help or to voice uh, their, 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 their need for help. So, so there are studies underway, and I think further down the road, when we have more targeted uh, suicide prevention interventions, then it's certainly worthwhile uh, to okay. target them also to men or women. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good. So let's move to a third question that we have, which is uh, another really important one, which um, is around the role of peer support, uh, the, the role of peer support in suicide prevention. And then there was another question, which sort of slightly different, but uh, also another particular, you know, what is the particular contribution of or role of people uh, of suicide attempt survivors themselves? Yes, certainly peer support is extremely important. As I mentioned during the presentation, everyone has to play a role in suicide prevention. And my peer, the person next to me at, at work or at home in my family or a friend, um, I and everyone need to listen. We know that talking or addressing suicide openly does not bring a person to, to do the act. It often is a big relief to talk about it, and it can allevi alleviate the suffering. So, yes, the role of peer support is essential. Everyone has to play a role. We need to be open and listen. The uh, survivor of a suicide attempt is actually something that needs to be very much, or this role needs to be very much strengthened in the future. Um, I have to admit that the report which was published last September was very well received, um, very well publicized and, and taken up. There was actually only one point of criticism because we talk about survivors usually in the sense of those who are left behind, those one who have, have lost a loved one. And we talk about those who attempted suicide and how important it is to provide follow-up care to them. Um, but actually the, the one who has attempted suicide and, and taking a role in developing programs or, or providing uh, comments or inputs to, to service development, um, this actually has not been clearly or as clearly as it should have been, has not been clearly mentioned. And um, we did have... Um, a speaker at the launch of the yeah. suicide prevention report here in Geneva, and her speech was very powerful mm -hmm. of how she did not receive the help she needed. It was not recognized at all, and only later on, um, after many attempts, uh, the, the services actually provided uh, the help uh, to her that she needed. And her speech was so powerful that every single speaker afterwards, it was an international expert, it was her Excellency, the Minister of State of Ireland, they all refer to her speech. And, and this is what, what really affects people to, to if someone dares to speak about the, their own experience. Um, I, I think this is very powerful and, and certainly needs to be, um, or someone who has um, uh, attempted suicide, but you know, uh, need to be more involved um, uh, to talk about the experience because others who listen to them, for them it's, it's, it's very motivating to then also address um, yeah. their own needs maybe. Yeah. Okay, that's very clear. So uh, uh, we're running a bit low on time, but uh, I'm aware that some questions might have been posted in the course of the, uh, the webinar. So if I could ask my colleague Sammy to... I have to select one of the questions that uh, has been posted. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. So if I'm going to select a question, maybe I'll select this one. It's about how will WHO uh, monitor and evaluate global achievement of the goal of reducing the rate of suicide by 10% by 2020? And how will we learn of our global progress towards achieving this goal? 
Um, WHO publishes uh, the WHO official global health estimate um, on a yearly basis about mortality, and this includes uh, mortality from suicide. So these uh, official WHO data uh, will help us uh, to monitor progress. And um, uh, uh, within the mental health uh, action plan, uh, the WHO secretariat is requested to report back to the executive board uh, which is uh, the me member states uh, representatives so to report back on, on the progress made. So there are instruments uh, for reporting and monitoring. And maybe we will have another report in a few years' time. Um, okay, so look, uh, I think we're out of time here. So uh, I, I'm going to wrap things up and uh, uh, thank uh, Alexandra very much indeed for. Uh, agreeing to take this on and talk uh, about this issue with us uh, and also to the, everyone else uh, who's been able to join the webinar today and hopefully they found it useful and uh, even had their questions uh, answered. So with that, I thank you all again and wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Okay, bye-bye for now. Thank you, goodbye.